Good morning. Today's first scripture reading comes from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. Here, Paul confronts the church in Corinth about the divisions among them, reminding them that it is only the message of the cross that is important. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is to say that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except uh, Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say they were baptized in my name. I did baptize the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize you, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I now continue with our gospel reading, which this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 12 through 23. Jesus begins his ministry by calling his disciples and starting the work that he is to set out to do. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which is by the lake in the area of Zebulon and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulon and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon and Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called out them. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I ask that you open our hearts to your words of love and salvation. And as we hear your word, may we be transformed into a true community of believers, ready to go into the world to testify that Christ is alive and active in our lives today. Amen. As Jesus begins his time of ministry, he moves to Capernaum within the former lands of Zebulon and Naphtali, Lands given to Israel by the Lord. Lands now claimed and occupied by the Roman Empire. It was truly a dark time. Because like all of Israel, Galilee was under Gentile rule. Darkness and death surrounded them, especially in the rural areas where the peasants comprised most of the population. Their production and their earnings were taken through heavy taxes by the Romans, as well as the wealthy landowners. The elite were supporting themselves on the backs of the poor. And it was into this darkness that this new teacher emerges onto the scene. 
Our recent Bible study mentioned something most of us had not considered before. It talked about how Jesus' mission and ministry was subversive. But I think when we look at it, we find that that's true. Especially when we look at today's gospel reading. I mean, subversion is the systematic attempt to overthrow or undermine an established order or existing system by persons working within it. When we look at it, that's exactly what Jesus was doing. I mean, the first thing he does is proclaim, repent for the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven has come near. I mean, think about that. He's standing in a land occupied by the Roman Empire, declaring that the kingdom of heaven, God's empire, was at hand. In fact, God's kingdom was central to his message. He knew the kingdom of God is more than just some place we go to when we die. It's more than what we view as heaven. But that the sovereignty of God is eternal. And it's realized on earth whenever someone submits themselves to God's will. So the kingdom of heaven was truly at hand, drawing near, manifesting itself in the ministry of Jesus and in the midst of the disciples who decided to follow him. But his subversive actions didn't stop with his declaring the presence of another different kingdom or empire. No, he calls others to join him, to follow his lead, and he creates an alternate community, a new system, a new way of living, of being and doing. Jesus disrupts the priorities and the social and economic obligations of those who are called to follow him. In other words, he disrupt, disrupts the status quo. And we heard the truth of this today with Simon and Andrew, James and John. They dropped their nets, walked away from their jobs and their families, and willingly entered this new community, the new family created among those who follow Jesus. They weren't united by blood or family name, but by responding to the call of Jesus and doing God's will, thereby entering into the kingdom of God. They followed Jesus throughout Galilee, Judea, even into places like Samaria, wherever he went. Following him, learning from him as he taught in the synagogues, as he healed every disease and openly proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God. Now, as I said, we might not consider Jesus to be a subversive figure, but he absolutely was. He clearly was attempting to undermine the established systems of oppression systematically, one life, one community at a time. In his teaching, he counters the ideas of the systems in place, both political and religious. In his healing, he combats the effects of those systems, and he openly speaks of a time when God's empire would come and ensure the blessings of plenty and health for all, creating a new world order. And to make matters worse, Jesus took his message, his teachings and healings, not only to the people of Israel, but he included those on the outside as well, branching his subversive message beyond the confines of Israel out into the Roman Empire. I mean, he helped the Samaritan woman at the well, the servant of the Roman centurion, the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman, just to name a few. And when he healed the 10 lepers, he didn't ask for membership cards or whether they were children of Israel. And he in fact praised the one foreigner who was among them, who was the only one to stop and offer gratitude. Extending God's kingdom until it has finally reached this time and this place. 
eliminating any national or racial boundaries to God's kingdom. And through Christ and our faith, we too are able to enter in. Not just someday when we die, but right here and right now. Whenever and wherever we submit to the will of God, accepting God's reign in and over our lives. And yet throughout history, to this very day, Christians have forgotten one major point. When Jesus began his ministry, he called his disciples and then others to not only follow him, but to create that new alternative, even subversive family of faith. United together as his disciples, united together in the kingdom of God, learning the ways of Jesus and doing God's will. In his calling, he chose ordinary, average men and women to be his disciples. They weren't all the same. They were distinctive people, different in character, background, and profession, as we learn later on. They each had different gifts and abilities, and Jesus didn't choose people who all thought the same or acted the same, and he certainly did not try to make them all be the same. He did nothing to strip away their distinctiveness. They didn't always agree or get along, but they were united in one thing, following Jesus wherever he would lead them, learning from him and striving to be like him, serving God by teaching and healing and preaching the coming of God's kingdom. Unfortunately, the unity displayed by the early church didn't last long. We see the truth of that in the church in Corinth. Corinth was the capital of the province of Achaia, and it grew to be one of the largest and most prosperous cities in the Roman Empire. It was very diverse in its population. It was a true melting pot of cultures. And it was a society where the majority of the people lived hovering just around the poverty line. About 25 to 30 percent lived below it, and only about 2 or 3 percent were considered the elite. Honor, wealth, and power were the measurements of social status. And sadly, the divisions in the church seemed to mirror the divisions in the Corinthian society. And word reached Paul that the church in Corinth was being torn apart, divided into factions theologically, divided by loyalty to specific leaders and teachers, and divided by their own class and status outside the church. Paul was greatly concerned about this because he knew that disunity threatens the mind, spirit, and mission of the church. So he writes his letter, and he stressed that there should be no divisions in the church. Instead, the people of the church should be united in mind and purpose, united in the grace of God that was given to them in Christ, the one who called them to be together in fellowship. Well, it seems like not much has changed in 2,000 years because our nation is also a diverse conglomeration of cultures with the majority living just a little above the poverty level while there are millions still living below it and only a small handful considered elite and wealthy. We're divided based on politics, gender, race, age, and faith. Quite honestly, the list of divisions just keeps getting longer every year. And those divisions have spilled out into the church as well. With many of the divisions we see today within the church mirror, mirroring those in society. Within the church, we're divided by belief, religious teachers, political parties, class, etc. And just like the church in Corinth, Paul doesn't waste any time getting to the main point of our problem. The issue is our divisions, our factionalism, our us versus them mentality. In short, the issue we have in the church today is that too often the Christian church reflects the society around us instead of reflecting Christ. 
Rather than living as an example of what the Christian community is supposed to be, we've shifted into some sort of line drawing and team choosing that the rest of our culture revels in. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, Paul pleads, stop it. Stop being a mirror. Start being a lighthouse. Stop trying to blend in and start standing out, standing apart, being different. Paul's desire for the community is that we all be united. But we must note that just like Jesus, he never tells them to give up their differences. Like in Corinth, our church has great diversity. We have people who are educated and some who are uneducated. We have the rich and the poor, Jew and Gentile, male and female. The church today is comprised of all nationalities and skin colors and is rich in ethnic, political, and social diversity. And neither Paul nor Jesus tells us to change that. Instead, we're to focus on the one thing that unites us, Christ Jesus. As followers of the way, we're called to stop working against one another and instead work together, emulating Christ by radically disregarding the power and social structures of the world around us in order to accomplish God's purpose in the world. In contrast to the divisive values of society, Paul reminds us that the gospel's not about passive consensus. It's about the radical good news of God's kingdom breaking into our world as we turn back to God and submit to God's will, following the ways taught to us by Christ. It's about figuring out how to live together as a community in light of Christ's life-altering message. And it's about spreading the good news to others, no matter what political party they belong to, what their sexual preference or gender identity is, their legal status, their race, ethnicity. They are all too integral to the beautiful unity of diversity that can happen in Christ. Yes, unity in Christ also means that there are some things that are non-negotiable. For instance, we're to stand against oppression, injustice, and the neglect of the poor at all times, in whatever form we find it, speaking out against things like racism, sexism, ageism, xenophobia, violence, and the abuse of the vulnerable, taking up that subversive fight against injustice just as Jesus did so long ago. But too often we allow our differences to define who we are as Christ's church. We need to remember who we are and whose we are. We belong to Christ. In Christ there is no division. There is a new mind, a new purpose that is different from that of the world around us. It is the mind and purpose that centers on the love of God and the love of our neighbors. See, the church is to be a microcosm, a small representation of God's holy kingdom in the world today. The center of unity that's scattered throughout the world until that day when all the world is brought into the kingdom of God. The church should be a place that offers uniting and healing words to a divided and tragic world. I mean, let's face it, we will never all agree on everything. But if we can agree and focus on what truly matters, that Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh, that he died on the cross to save us, that he has risen to give us new life and calls us to love and serve one another. If we can focus on the basic tenets of our faith, we can do better. So let's keep in mind that we are called not to retreat into factions where we might feel more comfortable, but to courageously engage one another with truth and love. 
because the emphasis of our faith is not an idea. It's a mission, a subversive mission of love. It is the purpose and mindset that can bring us to unity in Christ, even amid our differences. Amen. Lord, for